How many people want advice from Justin on entrepreneurship and investment? Okay. Well, that's where we'll spend most of our time. But I, I wanted to start out because you have such a rich history and you've been amazingly successful and I'm sure everybody knows exactly who you are. But I, in 140 characters or less, how would you describe yourself? I'd stand next to people who are smarter than you. <laughs> that's a good way to do it. I think that's the secret to my success. Who has been the smartest person that you've stood next to that you think that you've learned the most from and why? I'd say my, uh, you know, my co-founders of Justin TV, which was kind of our first company that became the one that was most uh, successful. Those guys I, were, I was learning from every day. You know, they were better programmers than me, better managers than I was, better at fundraising, um, pretty much better at every. What everything. did you contribute? <laughs> well, I, I, I think my skill set actually. Th I thought a lot about that. Um, <laughs> Don't give all the credit away. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, I think the thing that I realize that I'm best at is I'm good at getting people excited about new ideas and getting them moving and getting some momentum going uh, so that all those smart people get in the same room and start talking. And so you had an amazing 2014, absolutely <laughs> amazing. It started out by selling your startup exec to HandyBook in an all-stock deal. And then in June, you joined Y Combinator as a partner, although you've been part-time with Y Com Combinator for a while, and you were part of the first batch That's right, right? Yeah. Uh, with their startup. And finally, in August, Amazon spent nearly $1 billion to acquire Twitch, which, I don't know if you knew this, but it was the third iteration of a company he started in 2007 as a reality show on the internet. That's right. Yeah, that was our latest, <laughs> our latest pivot in the a long latest. history of pivots. So what really stands out to you as being your most successful moment of 2014? So the thing actually that I was most happy about in 2014, which was, was um, every year I go to this art festival called Burning Man in the desert. And you've uh, heard of it, right? Yeah. <laughs> this year I, I built a giant iceberg that glows around a <laughs> freezer truck. And uh, so you could kind of climb inside, it'd be cold inside, and then on the outside it was like a glowing iceberg that would tra like, travel around the desert. That's pretty awesome. That was my, that was my moment of the year. <laughs> Nothing like working with your hands. Have yeah. you heard that Jonathan Teo wants to beat you out next year and wants to actually bring a 747 into the desert? He's already found that one. He's looking for $850,000. Are you in? Yeah, I saw that. No, I, I, my contribution is, is the iceberg. <laughs> okay, that's awesome. And so what can we expect from you if we're at December 31st, what, 2015, what will have been your greatest accomplishment? What can we look forward to from you? I don't know, actually. That's a, that's a good question. I'm, um, I mean, I'm working at Y Combinator, so I'm, you know, behind the scenes mentoring people who hopefully will become much more successful than I uh, have been. And, um, you know, I'm working on a few fun projects for myself that, you know, I'm, they're kind of on the back burner right now. So how do you think it, Y Combinator has actually changed since you were involved in that first batch? So I started in 2005. It was the first. When, when it started, it was like completely an experiment. It mm -hmm. wasn't, you know, now it's, I think it's much more of an institution and you know, there's a history of companies that have been successful that have come out of YC. But uh, when we started, it was just like we only knew about it, Emma and I, because we'd been working on this calendar app called Kiko in the... Um, in our like dorm rooms at, at Yale as seniors, and a friend of ours forwarded an email from Paul, uh, from Paul Graham, the founder of YC, to that he had sent out to the, you know, the Yale computer science list that said, uh, we want to fund companies by you know, people who have no idea what they're doing effectively. <laughs> and we we're like, we have a we have no idea what we're doing, and we're a company, so and we we would like funding, so we uh, went to the website that he had set up and filled out the application. Uh, it was like the do that night and we filled it out. We stayed up like, I remember being in the computer lab at school, like working on it um, until like 2 a.m. and then we sent it in and then um, Paul came back and said, hey, like he sent us an email a couple days later that was like, well, there were three types of companies, um, companies that we thought had great ideas with great founders and companies that we thought weren't very good ideas um, with mediocre founders and companies that we thought, you know, they, the founders could be good, but the ideas were really bad and you guys were in the third category. <laughs> um, <laughs> so he's like, so how did you overcome that? Well, we, we said, uh, you know, he, he asked if we'd be interested in coming and maybe doing a different startup idea. And they said, sure, you know, well, maybe. Uh, so we ended up going there and uh, we convinced him that our idea was actually good. And um, so in that first batch of YC asked how it was different. It was very much like 
experiment. And Paul, like the format actually that YC is based around has stayed the same. It's like actually they discovered something that worked really well in the very beginning, which was get people who are you know reasonably smart or together um, and have them work on you know they'll work on building a company as fast as they can, kind of as you know getting as as much customer feedback as possible in a very short period of time, um, and then that will be a good springboard to like launch you know kind of these new companies and new ideas. And uh, you know that short period of time and the format really helped you you know connect with the people who were like feel like there was some camaraderie going through YC, uh, which existed today. You know we'd meet every Tuesday for dinner, and then like the idea that we you know kind of do as much as we could in three months to like actually build a real product made, meant there was a goal to like something to like work towards. You know, and so we still do that today. You know, and um, the only things that I think have changed really is is that like the quality of all the people and ideas and um, you know speakers and the alumni network and the investors at the end are all like a thousand times better remember the first batch was uh, in 2005 it was you know, the investors were like Paul's friends like mm -hmm. 15 of them I think there were literally 15 of his friends that he had like corralled into the room to like see the companies and I'm pretty sure that the average total amount of that was invested post YC was like two hundred thousand um, dollars you know, now Demo Day is like a pretty big Silicon Valley institution and like there's hundreds of investors and, um, you know, I think every class raises, you know, $200 million probably. Uh, so we, you know, the speakers back then were like Paul's like lawyer from his first startup. <laughs> and, you know, now they're um, much more accomplished Silicon Valley founders and, and um, you know, luminaries. And so I, I think that like everything has kind of gotten bigger and, and, and more improved, but like the core thing that made YC kind of work in those early days is like still the same thing. So was there anything that you wish they would have done to help you back then that you now being involved, you've been able to implement now with the new batch? Well, I think a lot of those things have naturally happened over the years. So I wish that we had more access to like a springboard to like get customers initially, right? And that didn't exist in 2005. Today it exists because lots of our YC companies, their first customers are other YC companies or, you know, they immediately get, are able to kind of release a product that gets some, you know, interest on Hacker News or Product Hunt and, you know, they can get some initial test customers. And that was something that we had a, like a lot of problems with like in our, our early days of um, our first company. Um, then investment is a, like another thing where we like, I think we raised after my first company $70,000 and we thought that was awesome. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we lived the entire year on that and like paid two employees oh on God. that. Yeah. And so we were, you know, it was, it was pretty tight. Um, but now like the average, average YC company is, you know, able to raise like substantially more at much better terms, like right after my combinator. And you have a really diverse badge, much more diverse than it, than it was back then. Is that partly your influence? I would say that's probably mostly Sam gets Sam. credit for that. Um, yeah. We've started investing in more types of companies, uh -huh. so um, lots more hardware companies. I think that's been a general trend, but um, also companies like biotech companies, um, uh, synthetic biology companies, and like, like uh, a few energy companies. Yeah, lots, lots of different interesting industries. Is there a certain quota? Or do you say that you need X number of these types of companies, X number of those, or do you wait till the batch comes in and then you say, literally, we're just going to take just the best of the best and that's it of whatever companies there are? Yeah, we take a, you know, we take some percentage of people who apply, right? So it's the batch is composed of, you know, really a reflection of who applies. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, we don't have quotas. We have ideas. There's a we've released like a um, request for startups for like a, a long list of ideas that we think are interesting. And that's just really, it's not we as a firm, it's really like some of the partners thought those things specifically were interesting. And so generally what we invest in the things that we personally like, we think are interesting ideas, interesting insights into an interesting industry, good founders. Um, it's really based on like, we don't have a quota of like, we need to, we don't have a, a thesis as a firm is like this thing is going to make money or this thing is going to change the world. We like, really just look for people who we think are going to do something that we think is cool. So what is the application process like and who who's responsible for it? So the, the application process is pretty straightforward. It's we have two, two times a year we run a batch um, that's three three months long. So there's one going on that just started January through March and then June through August. And the application for those batches opens a couple months before then. It's a pretty short application. 
it's worth doing. Uh, it hasn't changed much since we since 2005, actually, but we've added a few questions. And I think it's worth doing because the questions are designed to make you think about your business. And even if you don't actually want to apply to YC, I think it's good that you have answers to those types of questions. Uh, so we encourage, you know, I tell people, like, it's not a waste of time to do it. Um, and it doesn't take very much time. Uh, so, you know, we, and, and also the last thing is, like, I think sometimes people are afraid of being rejected, but they, they shouldn't be. Like, lots of founders who were awesome, um, you know, weren't, didn't get it. We missed in the first, you know, pass through on, on with YC. Like, uh, Dropbox is an example of, you know, Drew had applied previously, and we, we didn't, you know, identify that as like an awesome. Were you a part of the yeah. process when Dropbox? No, it's when not my it? fault. It's, Paul, it's, it's PG's fault. Um, is there any one that you would take responsibility for that you're like, darn it, I missed that one? Not yet, but I'm sure there will be, which is a very frightening thought, actually. We have like, you know, I think we're very paranoid about missing, just like all investors, you don't want to miss um, something that's amazing. And so uh, a lot of time is spent, you know, reading through those applications. So once they come in, um, you know, we spend time, we I pull away for like a two weeks and, and just read applications every day. Um, and then we, you know, select some number of those to invite for a, like an in-person interview. How involved is the alumni in the selection process? Because what's interesting is that alumni seem to be really just overall involved. I'm wondering if that's a requirement of YC it, to be involved as a, as a startup initially, that they have to come back and help? Or no, are there's, people- There's no requirement. I think that, so the alumni are involved in a couple ways. Um, one prominent one is that like during the interviews, a lot of alumni will just be hanging around and like kind of, they, I think they help calm people's nerves and like coach uh, like people. And they, um, I think a lot of them are actually looking for like future employees uh, <laughs> or like people to work with. Um, so they, you know, they'll come kind of be part of that, that uh, process. And then another way is like actually a lot of, quite a few alumni <laughs> coach uh, prospective candidates now. Like a lot of people will ask for advice on like, oh, what do I, you know, do mock a mock interview with me, mm -hmm. um, and that's that's not like a YC program or anything. It's just kind of something that's happened organically. And it looks like you're expanding globally, and you already had a startup school in London. I'm curious what the strategy is going forward with international expansion. What can we expect? So I think YC is you know for the foreseeable future, it's always going to be in Silicon Valley because we think that like it's good for companies to come here. I mean, I probably don't have to sell you guys. You're all here already. Um, <laughs> But like for for companies out overseas, we you know oftentimes I'll say like it's good even if you don't want to stay in California, it's good like it's great because you have this massive access to people who have built company you know technology companies before, and there's like also a lot of uh, access to capital, mm -hmm. and so you know an example is uh, Bella Beat who was in the batch a year ago, um, they make a wearable for um, you know pregnant mo mothers to like track their baby's heartbeat, and mm -hmm. th that was something that. Um, those guys were really excellent founders, really great at product design. They came here and they were able to raise this $4 million C round after YC and really accelerate their business. You know, most of their development, all of their development, development is still in Croatia where they're from. But, you know, it was really, I think they would say it was a really good idea to come here even for a short period of time. Um, so we, you know, we're not expanding YC to other locations and like franchising it or anything like that. But we do realize like, most of the smart people in the world are like not in Silicon Valley. You know, Silicon Valley, America probably only has, I think PG said, 5% of the smart pro programmers. And so, you know, our goal in going around, you know, to other markets is, is to find those people and tell them, hey, YC is an option for you. We want to invest in your company and we want to help you build your business. And, you know, we want to reach that other 95% of people who will be successful entrepreneurs. So where do you think the hottest engineers are right now outside of the U.S.? I think do you the, want to give that away? <laughs> I think I like I really like Eastern Europe. I think there's like lots and lots of talented people. Um, I was very I, I went to, to Croatia this summer and I, I was like very impressed with the quality of products and that people were building. Um, I think the most interesting markets in the world are in Southeast Asia and India right now. Um, so I don't know that if I was going to build a company and just trying to make money, that's where I would probably go. What's your best advice in hiring engineers and the right engineer? Do you have to get the best of the best engineer and pay through the nose for that engineer in order to put together a really great product? Well, my best advice is that you should learn how to be, be a programmer yourself yeah. because like, that's the easiest way to make your pro product. And there's like infinity people who are like trying to like convince some programmer to like build their thing. 
the easiest way to do it is even if you're a crappy programmer is to just like, when I started off, I wasn't a CS major. I just like learned how to become a programmer by trying to like hack up the crappy prototype version of our first online calendar. And you know, like three years later of, of like trying hard, I was like a you know, decent web developer. I'm still a pretty crappy programmer. Um, but you know, like I, I am good enough to prototype an idea and like show people like, you know, get it seen by people so they can kind of play around with it and I can evaluate if it's a good idea. I think the best person that you should work to work with, the best programmer to, to find is the one that like will actually work with you. It's like most, for most people, they don't have that many options. With um, When I first started my company, my co-founder was uh, my childhood friend who happened to be a CS major and the only CS major that I knew, mm -hmm. right? So he um, kind of coached me on, on development and programming, but you know, he was like the guy, he was, he was the only person I knew. My, he, he always says, um, he would say this thing that I found really annoying actually at the time, but you know, I think it's true is he, was, he would always say, oh, you go to war with the army you have. Mm -hmm. and he would usually say it as an excuse for why like we were like building something slowly or you know, like during the, over the course of our startup or why someone, you know, like, but I think it's true. It's like, he was like my friend and he was convenient to like work on this startup with and that's who I, that's who I worked with. Um, and I think that that is definitely the case for like every other successful YC company. It's like the co-founder that they, you know, the co-founders met because they were friends or that they, they knew each other in college or they worked together at a startup, another startup or something like that. They, you know, it's just random, right? They didn't like to do this like American Idol, like let's vet the best programmer in Silicon Valley and then they're going to work on my idea. And so just speaking of uh, advice for entrepreneurs and and such, your advice uh, to entrepreneurs, don't do a demo when you get in front of an investor. Especially oh, okay. if you just yeah. have three minutes. That, I think that was from my, so I, I was watching a startup pitch competition in uh, Turkey this year and, and um, people would try to like, in three minutes they would try to go through like a demo and their like financials and all every sorts page of, of their app yeah every you, you, <laughs> look you, when you're on stage if you're pitching someone and like let's say you're trying to pitch me and i'm walking to my uber which is going to happen like in about an hour <laughs> like i you know i only have a very limited amount of like you only have a limited amount of time right you have to convince me you're not trying to convince me at that moment that i should invest in your company right you're actually only convincing me to like stop walking or like, so you have to like be interesting or say something interesting or compelling enough to like get to the next step. Like you just have to, it's a step-by-step -step process. And the first step is like getting them interested in actually talking to you. And I think on stage, a lot of people are trying to jump to the last step, which is like proving that you're an investable, awesome company, right? That's going to explode. Like, no, like first just start trying to, you know, make a, tell a very short, compelling story, which is going to get people interested in talking to you. And so and that's I, what we tell people at YC, like, that, you know, this is a huge thing that we teach at YC, which is how to present your company and, and build excitement for your company. And you can't get people in a three minute presentation, people will remember one thing, maybe two if you're lucky, right? So like figure out what those two things are and like try to get them across. So key criteria, 60 second pitch, figure out one or two points that you want to make. Anything else? It should be compelling points. <laughs> <laughs> How do you know if they're compelling? If you're listening and not getting into your Uber and driving away? Well, I mean, you can practice your pitch, right? You don't have to practice on me or Kim. You can practice on the people who are at here, right? Like, like uh, right next to you. And those people, like if their eyes glaze over in like 60 <laughs> seconds or in 30 seconds, that's bad, right? Like if they are like interested, like if you have a compelling product or idea, by the end of your conversation, if they actually believe that you're going to be really successful, they should be like, how do I like give you my $5,000 or $100 or like, can I like freelance for you or work with you, right? Like that's like the sign that you actually have something that is like good, right? Like that you can, you don't, you know, I'm not any different from the guy next next to you, right? Like you can practice pitching on, on him like um, or her. You can, you just need to, like, you want a good reaction. You need to get like a positive reaction from people when you tell them about your thing. What was the most compelling pitch? Who completely just did it right? Who stands out to you? I think the Zenefits um, founder, Parker. When I met uh, Parker, I was, he, you know, I met him for, um, he wanted some advice, like in the very early days, like the first couple of months of their company, after they'd gotten into YC. 
And I was like, I want to invest in the drug company right now. He didn't want my money. I had to convince him at that. I, I said in like 20 minutes, I was like, I want to give you money right now. And he was like, uh, we raised enough money. And I was like, no, he's like, you have, like, I will do help you. I'll do anything. <laughs> and so I, um, yeah, I made him like, I made him agree to take money right then. And I, that was like, one time I can remember what was what was so amazing about the pitch was it his presence his confidence the air the I think the usefulness the the product was clearly (laughs) solved a problem that I experienced before I was I believed that every business could use it so it was like a very big market and it was a really built-in model and he they clearly were people who were very him and Lux were like we're gonna do this like we're there they were building it you know it was clear that they were gonna make it happen so give us an example of a pitch that went horribly wrong. Hopefully there wasn't one tonight with the line. <laughs> no, I think that like most pitches, it, most pitches don't like crash and burn. Some people like try to argue when you're like giving them feedback or you're saying like, I don't know if this part would work, they would like argue with you, right? And that's when people, it's like, well, what's my incentive here? Like, I don't care if you actually listen to me. Like, so I'm not gonna spend, like then my brain like shuts off, right? But most people aren't like terribly bad. They're just not good enough. They don't like tell a story that makes me say, oh, I want to give you money right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's like, I don't know, the, I guess you might as well have argued with me at that point, right? So um, I think that like you, you know, it's not, there's not one thing that's, you just, it's just not, not compelling enough, right? So what do you think? Do you think that a lot of companies have gotten just overly distracted by the pitch? And that at some point it's just going to be ridiculously just outrageous. I just ran Richard Branson's startup competition, the semifinals, over at CES. And our 10th finalist gets up on stage. And granted, he count. How many of you have ever counted cards at the gambling table? <laughs> he got caught by facial recognition technology within <laughs> the Bellagio. And he was so embarrassed by it, he gets right up on stage and he just starts very casually saying, hey, this is what I did. And uh, by the way, I do DNA laser printing and I'm going to get rid of all you sacks of shit out there in the audience. And the judges were like, oh my God. But they were laughing, they were entertained, and it was completely outrageous. <laughs> was, that, was that Austin? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I invested in his company. He's amazing. <laughs> So did Young Sun, the president of yeah. Samsung. He was like, that's Austin. <laughs> um, yeah, that's just, just great. Cameron's awesome. They're like, that's, I don't know. It could be something that's like really huge. Um, it's a great company. It was just completely, it was the most entertaining pitch. When it posts, I guarantee it's going to go viral. It was, yeah. it was outrageous. Yeah, I love Austin. So, um, <laughs> So what are you asking again? <laughs> Do you think that uh, startup entrepreneurs have become uh, or are getting more and more distracted by having to focus so much on the pitch that it's just going to get ridiculously oh. out of control? Well, he has like a business that's actually really compelling. It is. So like that's so like kind of a anything. prerequisite to like actually, your pitch is mostly irrelevant if you don't have something that's like an interesting business, right? Because like fundamentally all these things that are like fundraising or getting press or like any all these things that people do are just like means to an end at the end is having like a good business and sometimes you like cargo cold and forget that you're actually trying to create something that makes money right that like grows and so the best way to pitch someone like you know I will invest in a found like I would invest in founders who are like I don't even think are like that good or like terrible or something if they have something that's growing that like clearly people want, right? Like mm-hmm. that people want to want to use. And I think that like that the primary thing that people should do is work on their product and make it good. Like that's the best pitch of them all is like some traction, user traction. Do you think that people try and pitch and, and you know, investors a little bit too early today? Well, I think it's always good to practice and there's like probably infinity investors out there. So you should like, it's good to practice, but don't get distracted by pitching your startup for investment, right? The, the thing you need to do to be a successful company is have a product that's actually people want, mm-hmm. right? Like that's the very simple truth. And like, you know, you can have a successful company without raising any money at all, but you can't have a successful company without having something that people actually want. So what are you investing in now? I, all sorts of things, uh, lots of different, you know, technology, some consumer apps, like uh, biotech companies, um, I invested in an AI company. Um, I don't know, things that are like built by people who I think are doing interesting things that, um, you know, I think are going to be like smart founders who don't give up. Mm -hmm. 
And where do you see the greatest white space? Where should people be investing their time right now and in innovating? I think there's a lot of like interesting stuff that people are building in synthetic biology that are like setting the stage for you know big companies in that in that area. I don't know much about it. I'm kind of new to the space, but I'm learning a little bit. Um, and I think that that's going to be a huge area of innovation. It's going through like a you know the, the computer revolution that's like the computing revolution. So I, I think that's I don't know. It's interesting to me. Um, yeah, that'd probably be the biggest. We have a bunch of audience questions, but on the topic of advice to entrepreneurs, you recently wrote a great post called The Founder's Guide to Selling Your Company. And I'm wondering if you can elaborate on that because you pretty much are an expert selling Twitch for $970 million. Well, I can't, I can't take all the credit for that. That was really mostly my co-founder, Emmett, who's running the company as a CEO. And, um, you know, I, I was uh, just on the board at at Twitch when we, by the time we sold. And so he was really driving the process and I was on the Emmett train. Um, but I think that like I wrote the post because I wanted to, there's like not a, not a lot of information out there and I was thought it would be helpful to people. Like we had a lot of, we have a lot of YC companies who go through, uh, get acquisition offers and like enter in the process or aren't sure that they should. And I wanted to like just outline all my collective knowledge of years of mostly unsuccessfully yeah. trying to get my company, you know, the, the company bought, like there were lots of times we actually tried to sell our company and then like failed. Um, and those ones aren't the ones you hear about, right? And then at the end, finally there's like, oh, it's successful. Um, but it's as much for the times that weren't like dr drawing on the times of like, that we weren't successful as it was the, the times we were successful. And I wanted to just share that information. I wrote it at first just as an internal YC post for our founders, but then I realized there wasn't really anything that you know, I wasn't comfortable sharing with the, the outside world in it. So I thought it would be helpful to people, you know, generally. And, and uh, that was the inspiration for it. And the best piece of advice? What should entrepreneurs watch out for? Well, I mean, it really, it's like you are, if you enter in an acquisition process, you are like, should be, you should basically not enter into one unless you are sure you would want to sell the company because it's like the most fatiguing, distracting process and actually has a lot of, op there are a lot of opportunities to actually kill your company or derail your company through it. And people like always like, you can't, it's one of those things where you can't just test the waters, right? You can't say like, oh, I wonder how much it's worth or whatever, because it actually affects the value of a company. It's probably driving it down um, because, you know, it takes all your time, like com all your time. And it makes you stop working hard because you think, oh my God, like maybe I can, you know, actually end this misery of like working 20 hours a week, or sorry, a day for no pay, right? Um, that I've, I've been doing it for like years. Like maybe I can like, someone will pay me like potentially millions of dollars to like not do that. That sounds great. Um, and so you start thinking of the life that you want to have and not the one that you do have and you stop working on the company you do have and start thinking about the, the millions you might have. And that's like, you know, that's like, um, it's like poison. For your mind. Yeah. <laughs> and I heard someone in the audience, and I'm, I'm curious, just because I was, when I heard this, I, I was a little perplexed, but he was giving advice to someone here, not to pinpoint, I won't point this person out, but he said, the best M&A deal is one in which every party is unhappy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's, that, it means, true? that means that those two groups negotiated well, right? Okay. Um, they, they, if some one one side is too happy, then then um, I would hope like, it would be happy yeah. all around. But if, if I guess one side is is, is is too happy, then then maybe they got too bad, good of a deal. But the thing is, like, you don't have to worry about that because you're only on one side. Mm -hmm. So you should make sure that you're that as happy as you can be. <laughs> so shifting to uh, to all of your questions, if you have any more, make sure you grab Rob or right over here. Uh, she has some cards to pull around. Uh, what is the future of online video? What That's is the future of question. online video? I think Twitch is the future of online video. Um, so Twitch is a platform that lets people play and watch gaming content, video content, right? So people are coming on and they're streaming themselves play, playing video games and other people are watching. And for the past three and a half years, anytime I would explain this to someone, they'd be like, what are you talking about? That's crazy, right? Um, well, maybe the, you know, the, year, the time leading up until... Um, uh, Amazon's the Amazon acquisition, and after that, everyone's like, "What was the secret of Twitch?" But um, the thing is, like, the reason that this works is basically like there are 
people, it's like a niche. It, it lets people, um, basically, what, what I think was really innovative about Twitch is, is it, in, it was innovative in the way that YouTube was innovative, which it, we gave people the power to like kind of live, the, like be on video and like make their living from it, right? This whole class of people. Um, and those people like became, we had uh, over 100 people full time, like made their living like broadcasting video games on Twitch. They were like pro players and people were just entertaining and you know content creators. And, and so I, I think that's happening more and more across like all the different verticals. And that I think is the future of video. People doing it with like haul videos and style videos on YouTube and people using Patreon, which is this pretty cool platform that lets um, creators like almost uh, crowdfund the videos, their future you know content that they're creating. So a video creator can like go out to his fans and say like, pledge five dollars every time I create a video and then he has like a revenue source that enables him to like actually be a full-time content creator and I think that that is like kind of the, the first iteration was YouTube and just letting people put their content online and uh, the next iteration is letting people like this long long tail of people like you know do it as a living so why do you think some startups want to keep their operations secret I still see stealth all across the web Good or bad? Well, I think the mis misconception usually for early entrepreneurs, and I was like exactly the same. Uh, when we were working on our on our on Kiko, our calendar app, I was scared to tell people. I remember I was like in a job interview in my senior year, and I was afraid to tell the interviewer this like project that I'd been working on, um, that like because I thought he would like steal my idea. But what I didn't realize is like no one is gonna like quit their job and like steal some college student's idea, right? Like of like his online calendar. That was like, like I was afraid of telling people because I thought they would like just rip me off, but like mostly they didn't even care at all. You know, and I had to, I had to work on my pitch and like convincing them that it was like a good, th like a good idea. And, and so um, I encourage people to be, you know, open about what they're doing and like get feedback. Like the, the sooner you can get feedback, the better. And, and if you stay in, stealth mode and like don't get any feedback it could be the case that like you know after working on the product for a long time you did like nobody actually wants it so what are the most effective ways to get an angel investor's attention i don't and know if i should uh <laughs> say it's a dangerous <laughs> dangerous knowledge but um i mean i think the best thing to do is like actually most people in silicon valley are reading all of their emails and most people's emails are out there it's like actually pretty easy to get access to people I think the best thing to do is like have a concise and very compelling pitch about why your company is good. You know, like it's, I don't know, there's no like the ha hacks or like, I remember reading like Dave McClure like invest in a company who like gave him a ride to the airport or something. Like you don't need to think of like some innovative hack to like get someone's attention. Most people are reading their email or like they're probably one or two connections away from you on like, you know, from friends of friends, right? So. Uh, you just really need to work on actually having a compel compelling investable product. What's the biggest turnoff? Uh, I think the biggest turnoff for me is when people don't take feedback. Like they don't, like, I don't, um, if you don't think I'm right, uh, like that's fine, right? Like I might be wrong. I'm, I've been wrong lots and lots of times. Um, I remember hearing of like one of my friends uh, pitching me this idea in two, 2010, I think, um, at this meetup. And I hadn't seen him in a while, and he was telling me about this bookmarking app he was making. Um, and I was like, I went home and I thought, that's never going to work. And it was Ben from Pinterest, right? So I've, I've always been, I've been wrong probably more times than I've been right. Um, but if you, like, are listening to the, my feedback and you're, like, arguing because you, you, you know, you don't like hearing it, then, you know, why are you even engaged in a conversation with me? Is YC interested in nonprofits? Yeah, so uh, YC as our way of giving back, the way the, the thing that we thought we could do that was like most impactful other than just the partners like donating money was uh, to identify nonprofits that we thought had like some startup DNA in them and helping them, uh, you know, internalize that and, and like approach their solving their problems like, like a startup, you know, like how do you create a sustainable model? How do you figure out how to grow, you know, what you're doing? Um, and so we've been doing that for about a year and a half now, and uh, maybe two years actually. Um, and so far, it's uh, it started off as like PG just identifying this company that was on Hacker News or this nonprofit company called Watsi as like a very you know they were in, very interesting and innovative. And 
uh, you offer them a spot in the YC batch and a, a grant effectively. And so, um, you know, now we're continuing to do that and, and we have a few nonprofits in every batch. Are we on the verge of a bubble? Is a bubble coming? Uh, I, I don't, I don't How many times any, have you heard that question? Yeah, it's like, I don't think there's a bubble in early stage tech financing because the total amounts are so low and the amount of like actual customers that are on the internet now compared to, you know, 20, well, you know, 20 years ago um, is relatively much, much, much bigger or just magnitude bigger. So I, to me, it's, uh, the answer is, is no. I, you know, but I don't know. I'm not a, I'm not really a public markets person. <laughs> Keep it positive. How much should founders pay themselves when they get funding? And we're not talking about serial entrepreneurs who have literally bought, sold, sold, bought. I, I mean, I think people should pay themselves enough that they're not thinking about how much they're like pay, paying okay. themselves. You that's know? A, I think that's that, really good advice. Yeah. You should pay, like if you have a family and a bunch of ki you know kids and you probably need to like support them and you should not have to worry about like your family, right? Like you should be worried about your startup. It's like a big enough thing to worry about as it is. So, um, you know, I, as a investor, I guess I, you should, I encourage companies, YC is very adamant about like encouraging companies to keep their burn rate as low as possible, right? Um, because cash is, uh, you know, your, it's your life, right? It's that, that if you run out of cash, your company dies. And, um, but that being said, you should like pay yourself whatever, you know, what you can, need to, to like actually work on your company with your full attention. There's a huge wave of social entrepreneurship. Are traditional investors interested in social ventures? Are traditional investors interested in social, social ventures? ventures? I know 35% of our Extreme Tech Challenge uh, entrants, social ventures. I was really surprised there are a lot of companies globally that are working on social ventures. What were some of the interesting ones? Um, there was one that is actually creating the first ever underwater wine cellar uh, using creating artificial reefs. And it's pretty amazing. They're actually creating reefs and using them as wine cellars. But well, they're what? also doing ocean research in the meantime. Why would they <laughs> use them as wine cellars? Because... <laughs> Seems it's like pretty, it's hard there's to go a grab lot of research bottle. in it. Actually, I'm waiting for them. We're, we're inviting them to Necker Island to speak in front of Richard Branson so we could hear the entire pitch. It was pretty phenomenal. Okay. Very captivating. Uh, well, if that's counted as a social venture, then yes, yeah. I think investors they're are interested in social ventures. trying to save the ocean. Yeah. If you can save the ocean while like, storing wine, I mean, I think that's that's win-win. <laughs> Um, what would you say to an inspiring entrepreneur who is 30, 40, or 50 years old? Well, I think I'm there's a big difference in those age. 31, so I hope it's like not too I hope late. It's okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think that like you know, it, you should just work on your company. I don't know. I feel like there's like people always. A lot of times people think about like why they can't do something, right? Like, oh, I'm. You know, YC doesn't invest in people who are older. Well, that's not true. We invest in, in founders who are in their 60s. Um, but like we, like YC, like you should just think of, focus on the things that you can do, like the, the things that like you can do, like the reasons why you can build your company, why you should start your company right now, not like the things that might stand against you, right? And I think that like um, every, you know, every person, every founder has like, things that stand, the barriers that they have to overcome to like start their startup. And, um, you know, age might be something you perceive of as a barrier or you perceive that other people perceive as a barrier for you. And, you know, that you shouldn't let that stand in your way. I mean, you should just build your company. Like if you have a product that is growing, people will want to invest in it if you're 80 years old. That's like if you had Facebook and it was growing like exponentially, like it doesn't matter who you are. Like people would want to invest in it. So on a more personal level, what are some of the issues and struggles you ran into with your co-founders and early employees? As an early stage company, what people problems should an entrepreneur watch out for? Well, I, I think that like, honestly, we had like every single type of personnel or people problem. We like probably experienced that firsthand. Um, you know, when a lot of founders are, especially first time founders are like terrible managers, especially younger ones. Like I was... Um, you know, had never even worked at a company, right? So like, how would I know how to like manage teams of people? Well, it turns out I didn't. I didn't have like some innate talent for management. I was just really bad at it. And so we burned out like all of our initial employees. 
who were like, I was like, oh, they're not being productive, except we provided like no guidance for what the definition of like success was for their jobs. So um, we had like massive amounts of problems with our early employees, but it was all like management driven. And I think that's, I can see that happening in like many different companies. Um, and eventually founders like learn how to like actually manage people and they get co you know, coached and kind of uh, fix those problems and work them out. Um, and with my early f founders, like one of the big problems that we experienced was uh, one of my co-founders was the CEO of Justin TV, but we didn't like, it was kind of like in name only. We made all the decisions together and that was like horrible because it's kind of like too many chefs in the kitchen, right? We were like, mm -hmm. um, everyone like we ha all had to weigh in on everything. We weren't like dividing and conquering, right? Like the CTO, the CEO, the VP engineering and the I was a chief product officer or whatever, all four co-founders would like debate like whether there should be timestamps on the chat. Like that really someone, one person could decide that. Like or, you know, like whether we should in, go with this bank versus this bank or this PR firm versus PR firm. Like no one had the agency to like be in charge of like even some, you know, part of the company. And that was like a huge problem. And I eventually we learned like how to divide and conquer, but it took like four years of arguing. And I strongly encourage people to like, you know, grow a little faster than I did. <laughs> what do you think of food tech? Food tech. Uh, I like Spoon Rocket and Sprig. Um, I think those are like one, one where I like, that's another one where I was like, I don't think that's going to work. But I didn't understand what was actually happening kind of behind the scenes. And so... Um, I think those are like really, that's, that's interesting. And um, I think there's interesting devices, you know, um, kind of like, uh, I have like a home sous vide insertion, uh, there's a sous vide circulator machine, and I thought that was pretty cool. But that's, you know, I, I, um, I think generally, those are probably the two things that I like actually use that's, that are food tech. And you mentioned a little bit of hardware. Can you talk about why hardware companies overall are popular now, and what are the best companies to invest in? Um, sorry, just think more about food tech. Actually, the thing that I I um I think the hard part with food tech is that anything with like food itself actually is um it's like pretty hard to scale. Like the there's a couple reasons. Like one is um like food is like perishable generally, so a lot of like things have like these supply chain problems where they have to store food or make it at certain times. There's like a lot of wastage that hurts your margin. Um, and the other thing is like a lot of, you know, things like Spoon Rock and Sprig, even though I think it's a great model in order to scale it, they have to like build, you know, like kitchen facilities or get them in, in all these different areas. So mm -hmm. I don't know, it's a hard business, but there might be some, something there innovation wise. I think like Instacart has a really good model, you know, piggybacking on top of existing grocery stores. So sorry, what's hardware? Overall hardware. People, it exists, people are innovating on it. I, um, I think there's lots of, well, I think it's kind of like one of those um, areas where there's like, it's like the Uber for X. There's like everyone's trying to like make the smart everything. I've seen everything yeah. from like the smart the smart door lock. yoga mat. I think the smart door lock is probably actually something that's going to exist. But I've seen yeah. the smart yoga mat and the smart like skateboard Fitbit thing and the smart vibrator and smart like <laughs> like literally smart every single possible thing you have and probably you don't need to plug in every possession you own and like tr have it track you know your every like everything it possibly could possibly could track so i think that like like there'll be a very few of those things will actually become you know successful mainstream consumer products but so, i have no idea what which ones they, they will be that you know, will be successful so what advice do you have for startups generating some revenue in a big market but are between a seed round and an a round or series a what advice do I have for startups that are generating some revenue in a big market but are between a seed round and a series A? Uh, you, you need to grow more, get more sales, right? Like you just need to, I mean, either get, find more channels or your customer, if, you're, you're, if it's not spreading among your you know, customers, if you, then you need to, like basically you need to figure out acquisition that scales, right? Like that's the thing barrier, I think, to most companies that have something that's kind of making money, but like, hasn't gotten to the next level like you need to find a way to c acquire customers at like less than you make from them hopefully much less um, sometimes that's because the pro people the product is so compelling that people share it with each other sometimes it's because you have like really good channel relationships um, but if you don't have something that someone can pour money into 
like C, series A, what people call series A now is like pretty much like what was series B when I started off. And people would only invest that if, into companies that actually ha could use that to make more money. They like had a model that was like working. And so um, my suggestion is you keep working on your model and like figuring out like how to get more customers. This one I'm going to try and read. Um, it's a little bit uh, tough. But getting momentum up and helping your co-founders, uh, keeping your co-founders involved and excited is a great skill set. But as soon as the company, quote, works, it may become redundant. In what aspects have you seen most valuable to your company and co-founders after Twitch? Oh, goodness, I don't think this makes sense. After uh, was working properly. I don't. I can't read them. So I'm sorry. I whoever think the question was. was like, "What are you? What did you do after Twitch was working?" With all of your co-founders. Yeah. Well, we lost. I mean, we basically all went off and did like different, started new companies. And Emmett was the one who really built it. Emmett and um, our CEO at at Twitch, Kevin, were the ones who like did the hard work and built it from something that was clearly there was like it was working well mm -hmm. to like something that was worth a billion dollars. So as the founder of a technology sorry, or a... Uh, sorry, actually, the thing you can do, right, as a founder, once you have something that's working well, is just spend your time recruiting a great team. And yeah, I think that's, people are everything. That's like the most important thing. So our product is solving a huge problem we have every day at work, but it's more of a tool than a big product we could charge for. Should we figure that part out before applying for YC or would a strong team with a great tool already suffice? I think the strong team with the great tool would already suffice. Like we we fund people who, you know, some people have products that are making revenue, some have products that aren't making revenue, some don't have a product yet. It's just two people with an idea. Like I, we try to fund the entire range. Here's and we, con we consciously actually focus on funding companies, uh, making sure that we invest in some companies that aren't like, you know, are very, very early stage, right? Because I, I think that there's a tendency to like be able to shift later uh, mm -hmm. because of, you know, as we get more and more successful companies at our later stage interested in applying to YC, um, companies if at, at a top, high, very high level companies that are like new might not look as good, right? But it's really important to us that we just I, stay to, true to our roots and like really identify companies that could be, uh, you know, amazing when they, um, you know, even when, they, when they're just at that point of inception. One more question from the audience. Here's the scenario. You went to a no-name university and moved to San Francisco that has no alumni network in the area, and you want to start a company. How do you go about building the co-founder's team, and you have no money? I think a good idea would be to get a job. Um, no, 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 I'm not actually being facetious. I think that, like, so one example, one of my favorite examples of an entrepreneur is um, uh, my friend Aram. Uh, and so Aram started off, he moved, he dropped out of college, it, like he's like 19, I think, and he moved to the Bay Area because he wanted to be in the startups. And he sent me this email, we were hiring a community manager for Justin TV, and we had like, you know, dozens, like probably 50, email, you know, people who were qualified. I don't even think you have to be qualified to be a community manager. So the, he, he was one of these 50, and he emailed me, and his experience was he was a security guard and he had previously worked at Ben and Jerry's and he emailed and was like, I want to, this job, Justin TV. And he like, seemed like pretty articulate. So we were like, okay, we'll give him an interview. We interviewed him and he was the only person who came prepared with, um, like actually suggestions for what he would do if he was going to be a community manager, like specific things based on what our site was and like looked like. And I was like, that's awesome. Like there, we actually ended up hiring someone else though. Uh, but I, <laughs> However, I was like so impressed that I, I was like, you should have a, you know, you could work at Justin TV and just be like, a, basically like an intern. And the way he puts it is that he had inherited a grab bag of unwanted tasks, which is basically true. So at our, you know, he was like the office gopher and like tester and like, you know, all this, the horrible, most horrible things. Um, and so he, one of his jobs was to order lunch for the office. Because right, we, we, you know, and we would cater lunch and dinner, and uh, we also paid him really crappily, um, because you know we were we were like in the early stages, I guess, and so we, I suggested after like he, you know he worked at for, I, I don't know how long he worked for maybe eighteen months or something like that. I told him 
you know, after he was ordering this lunch, and I was like, pretty good service. So I was like, you should do this for a couple friends of mine's companies in the area when you call in this order every day and just like, um, and, and make some extra money like doing it because we pay you horribly. And um, <laughs> so he did that. And like a couple months later, he comes back and he's like, I quit. I'm going to go do this full time. Um, and he started this company called Zero Cater, which today is like a 50 person company and owns, you know, it's like a, as a 10,000 square foot office that's uh, doing really well, it's, you know, huge sales. Um, and so he came here knowing nobody with no education and pretty much no skills. Um, and like became a successful entrepreneur by, by like persisting, um, really like being driven to like figure out a, a true like product need and then also finding people that he could work with who became his early investors or his early uh, co-founders who, you know, from Justin TV. So uh, my recommendation is that you get a real job and then use those people that you meet at your job to create your company. So I have a few fun questions for you. Little fun fact. You just bought an I grow hair regrowing laser helmet. That is correct. That's true. <laughs> Why so. is that? I I'm looked in the kidding. mirror like, uh, yeah. <laughs> so is this an area you now plan to invest in? Well, based on I, a problem you have? We'll have to see if it works. I looked in the mirror a couple weeks ago and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> It's a significant hair loss. I understand, in, immediately understood why this was a multi-billion dollar market. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so at that day, actually, was there was CAS coverage from TechCrunch on, um, you know, this I grow hair helmet laser thing. And, you know, I was pretty desperate, so I pulled out my wallet and I ordered one off Amazon. And um, we'll see if, before, I have to see if it works. If it works, I'll probably be the biggest evangelist. Maybe it'll give me part of the company to, like, be the face of it. Um, but yeah, no, I'm not, I don't have any investments in the hair space yet. And surprisingly, you had an experience that I've always wanted to have. I'm, I was a professional extreme sports athlete and I've always wanted to ride on the Red Bull DC six and oh, you yeah. had the opportunity to do it. Can you tell us about the interior interior of this plane? Yeah. The, so Red Bull it's bought this sick. plane, I think from South Africa or something. It was, yeah. and they, they, the DC six is a huge plane. It's, um, and it was built in, I think it's from the 50s or 60s, and they renovated it, made it into their private jet, and I got a chance to, in Austria this uh, last fall to like um, go to the Red Bull hangar, which is pretty cool because I'd always read about it. It's this big glass hangar. They've got all sorts of flying vehicles in there and a Michelin star restaurant. Um, so we spent the day there, and then they flew us back to Vienna on the um, DC-6. It was good. It's like an hour-long flight, pretty, pretty simple, but... Uh, it was pretty cool. I think Red Bull is like one of the most innovative companies on their marketing. You know, they're just they're willing to do anything. It's like they can just try try anything. And I have one more actually thing. I something from the audience here because I just think it's really funny. It says Justin, very helpful interview! Exclamation point. Can I pay you? Well, can I pay for your Uber home in exchange for two minutes? It's a pitch, but I would appreciate any advice. Exclamation point. Thanks, Randall. <laughs> okay. okay. Oh, there he is. <laughs> All right, I'll accept. I'll accept. Uh, there you go. <laughs> A big round of applause for Justin.